Uh, good evening. Uh, I'm Graham Allison, the director of the Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs here at the Kennedy School. And it's my great honor to welcome you to one of the first forums of the new year and to an extraordinary opportunity to see two great public servants and actually for Kennedy School students a training to grow up to make a difference in government, two terrific role models. Uh, uh, their resumes are in your program, so I won't rehearse them, but the thought that we might have today with what's happening in the Middle East and ISIL and Iran, two national security advisors who until a year ago were right in the middle of this, one as the National Security Advisor for Israeli Prime Minister Bibi Netanyahu, and one as Obama's National Security Advisor, who themselves work very closely together, uh, helping us reflect on how we understand what's now happening and how we think about what each of the governments is doing and what we think might be done otherwise. I think it's just a remarkable opportunity. So I really want to say thank you to General Amador and our colleague Tom Donlan for being with us. So Yaakov spent most of his career in the military, 40 years of distinguished service in the IDF and military intelligence. Tom grew up through a political route in the first instance, but then from the Carter administration on, has been in these very interesting jobs, parsing the combination of politics and policy, including uh, four years as President Obama's national security advisor. And both of them have thought about the Middle East. Both of them have thought about Iran's nuclear challenge. Both of them has thought, have thought about the U.S.-Israeli relationship. So all of those topics are good topics for us, uh, and we're, we're, uh, we're going to pursue them. The game plan for tonight is we're going to have a conversation here on the stage for the first half hour or 35 minutes, and then we're going to come to the audience where you're welcome to ask any question on any topic as long as it's brief and to the point. So uh, if I can come to Iran through the door of ISIL, or ISIS, or the Islamic State, which is very much on the minds of especially Americans right now, but also uh, the world, uh, President Obama having the week before said the US does not yet have a strategy for dealing with ISIL. Last Wednesday spoke to the nation and announced a strategy. So let's hear what he said, just briefly, and you can see it up on that screen if this works. I cannot see anything because well, of the lights. So. We have turned the lights down and can you play that? Yeah. So tonight, with a new Iraqi government in place and following consultations with allies abroad and Congress at home, I can announce that America will lead a broad coalition to roll back this terrorist threat. Our objective is clear. We will degrade and ultimately destroy ISIL through a comprehensive and sustained counterterrorism strategy. Okay, so two questions, and I think we'll start with General Amador. First, with respect to the threat that uh, President Obama says is a grave threat justifying a major U.S. undertaking, how do you assess the threat? And secondly, with respect to his announced strategy, which has a goal of degrade and destroy through a coalition that includes the U.S. playing a role in, in airstrikes, but not boots on the ground, how do you think about the strategy? And then, Tom, the same two questions. Uh, first, I want to thank uh, the Valfer Center for inviting me here in our Council General in Boston, which arranged it. Uh, it's a fantastic opportunity um, to speak in this uh, place to people who might be in the future leaders of um, 
United States of America and, and other countries. But not less than that, to meet my good friend Tom, I think that if someone in the future will have to, to have uh, an example of um, two uh, states um, working together with all the differences that we had, but succeeded to overcome it and to um, work together, um, it might bring the, the example of uh, Tom as one who led it from uh, Washington. And I really, uh, I was very, very lucky to have Tom in uh, Washington when I was the National Security Council of the State of Israel. In, and I'm, if there are very few issues that I'm proud about, one of them is the relations that I built with, the, with Tom during my, um, my job. So thank you very much for bringing me here. Now about ISIS. Um, from the Israeli perspective, ISIS is one of some or many uh, radical Islamist movement, movements in the Middle East, which basically, with all the differences, there are many differences between those groups. But at the end of the day, they have something in common. And this is the fundamental claim, that the Middle East should be, and, and areas in the Middle East, and some, for some of them, even the world, should be controlled by groups which represent the Islam. They argue between themselves and are very, even ready to kill each other which one is the real Islam. But each of them, all of them together, share one claim. In the, in the Muslim Brotherhood slogan, Islam or Hal, that Islam is the solution. So they fight what is the Islam that should be the one which will do the job. But they agree, and this is um, all of them, that Islam should be the main factor in the, and the, and the, con the one who controls those areas in the Middle East and for some of them even in the world. It is going from the Shiites uh, in Tehran to Hezbollah in Lebanon, from ISIS in Iraq to uh, uh, Hamas in, um, in, in Gaza and uh, Islam um, Muslim brothers in, in, in Cairo, and in a way even to, in some degrees, even to, the, uh, uh, to Turkey. So, and there are many differences between them. I'm not claiming that they are the same, but they have, there is something fundamental that they share, all of them. And this is why you can see Shiites helping Sunnis to fight Israel, because they have something in common. You can see Hezbollah sending his people and, and organizing a Sunni organization, Islamic Jihad, in Gaza, because they have something in common. Although those are Shiites and those are Sunnis, in Iraq, they kill each other, and in Lebanon, they might kill each other in the future, they kill each other in, in Yemen. But when it is coming to, to outsiders, they have many things in common and uh, they know how to, to cooperate. So from our point of view, ISIS is one part in a big group of um, radical Islamist movement which are um, against the existence of Israel, against freedom, against democracy. They look at the, at the United States of America as the big Satan, and some of them see um, others as the second one. In some cases, it's Israel. In some cases, it's not even Israel. It's the, the domestic um, um, ruling apparatus in those countries. Um, about the, the, um, the strategy from the professional point of view, I think that from our experience, to get what the president put as a goal for the United States of America, impossible to get without boots on the ground. You cannot use only Air Force in those places. You need people on the ground to help you for the process of targeting, to collect information, to bring it to the accuracy which is needed to attack and to kill those people. So, and it is, it's, it's easier in Iraq because you have the Kurds in the north and you have the Iraqi forces in the south and you can combine with them with some special forces. It would be much more complicated and almost impossible in Syria because in Syria you have much less um, tools of cooperation. And you need to build it. I believe that at the end you will have to build it by yourself based on your capacities and not the local capacity. But if I'm mistaken, and you, with others, 
succeed to build these capabilities within this, the, the, the rebels inside Syria, you might do it with outputs on the ground here and there, special forces. I'm sure that the president didn't mean that special forces will not be there. But I think that it's possible in Iraq. It's very, very hard to do the same in Syria. Okay. Tom, what, one of the virtues of your new life yeah. is that you can think widely and say whatever you think. So what, <laughs> what, <laughs> what, yeah. what, what do you yeah. think about the threat? I'm and just, what I'm, do you think about the yeah. strategy? I'm just going to go crazy now, okay. uh, Graham, now, <laughs> now that I'm out of office after 35 years of doing it one way. But uh, uh, first of all, thank you for having, having me here tonight. And, uh, and just to uh, echo something that uh, General Amidor said, uh, he and I had a model relationship, I think, between national security advisors. Uh, it was open. We had secure phones on each other's desk. Uh, we spoke frequently. We spoke openly. We brought together experts on both sides of, uh, uh, from Israel and the United States to really work through analysis and to come to kind of ground truth uh, about things. And um, it really was a mo and, and for a school that studies things like this, uh, I wanted to make that point. I think that he and I saw the job in similar ways uh, as an advisor to our principal, but as a coordinator. Uh, as a quiet coordinator in, in some ways, as a personal emissary of our, of our principles. Uh, so I think we had a similar view of the position and we really had a, I think, a model relationship that deserves some, might deserve some study. It'd be a good case um, study, be a good, be yes. a good, be a good paper for somebody, I think, to, uh, to do. Uh, additionally, Students listen, yeah, opportunity. Additionally, that uh, uh, General Amidor is really, really one of the, really one of the great, uh, great professionals uh, in Israel uh, and really one of the great people I've ever worked with. Uh, and he has an illustri really a, an illustrious career uh, as a real model. Uh, it's great to be here with you uh, tonight, General. Um, with respect to uh, ISIS, uh, this is the next phase in, our in, the, in the U.S. Uh, and, and, and global terror effort. Uh, it is a, uh, emerged as a, uh, as, as a multidimensional threat uh, in, the, uh, in the Middle East. Uh, it's a large group uh, at this point of somewhere between, you know, around 20,000 uh, 20, fighters. They're trying to build a proto-state, if you will, uh, taking parts of Syria uh, and, and Iraq. Uh, they moved quite quickly uh, across, uh, across Iraq, enabled, by the way, I think, uh, by support among the, some of the populace who were so alienated from the Maliki government uh, that they were willing to provide, uh, provide support for them to move across, uh, to move across Iraq. Uh, and they threatened Baghdad, and that, this is the, the source of U.S. involvement. What's the threat? The threat is in the region, obviously, to upend states in the, in the region, uh, and beginning with a real threat against the state in Iraq. Um, I think that uh, through U.S. involvement, uh, we have stemmed their territorial progress uh, to date, working with, as General Amador said, on the ground uh, forces, including the Kurdish forces, the Peshmerga uh, forces uh, in, uh, in northern Iraq, and beginning to work more effectively with the Iraqi security forces stop their, uh, to stop their territorial uh, advance and to, and to, I think, using the leverage, by the way, of our assistance, work hard to, get the, uh, to push the Iraqis to form a unity government. Uh, and I think leveraging that assistance was an assistance was an important was an important uh, uh, part of this. Uh, it is, I said, a multi-dimensional threat. First and foremost, in the region, but because of the number of foreign fighters which have come in to join this group, and it's become the principal magnet in the world for jihadis to come and fight. Uh, some twelve to fifteen thousand, we believe, have come in to come in. This includes, by the way, uh, maybe a couple of thousand from Europe. Uh, uh, the, uh, Matt Olson, the director of our National Counterterrorism Center, said recently maybe up to 100 from the United States uh, who have gone to fight. Uh, and of course, the, the, the threat there is, is the return fighter uh, who comes back to the United States, who comes back to Europe, who has an EU passport, who can move freely among uh, the countries in Europe and find, uh, find his way uh, to, a, uh, uh, to an attack. So that's an important intelligence challenge, one that we understand, but the numbers are big. And, and we have to, uh, have to address it. I want to also say with respect to uh, the threat, uh, it's important uh, to, uh, to keep this uh, in context of other threats we have from, as General Amador said, from these other groups. Today, uh, I'd have to say that the, that the principal homeland threat among groups to the United States is in Al-Qaeda core in South Asia and Al-Qaeda on the Arabian Peninsula in Yemen, uh, who have demonstrated a uh, intent, a desire, a goal, and the capability of launching attacks against the United States. And it's very important as we undertake this effort, and I'll talk about the strategy in a second, undertake this effort against the ISIS or ISIL group in uh, uh, Syria and Iraq, 
that we not lose sight of the fact uh, that we have other threats uh, and in some ways more developed threats with respect, to the, with respect to the United States at AQAP, as it's called Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, the Yemen group that, is, that has tried to launch attacks on the United States, uh, and Al-Qaeda Corps, who continues, although we, we have, through, I think, the most persistent, aggressive counterterrorism effort ever, uh, we have degraded them quite substantially, obviously, the Al-Qaeda uh, Al Corps, and that's the root of the strategy against, uh, uh, against ISIS. We know how to do this. Uh, and it'll be a it's going to be a multi-dimensional, uh, persistent, long-term effort to degrade these groups and take them down, uh, decapitate their leadership, uh, continue to push back against them in terms of territory that they hold, uh, degrade their forces through again. And it's not, it will not be an overnight uh, uh, kind of one battle or two battle operation. It'll be something that we think we know how to do, which is a persistent, long-term effort of a multi-dimensional nature to degrade these uh, uh, to degrade these uh, 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 organizations, uh, and that's what we're about. To, that's what we're about to undertake. It does have, as I said, it's a multi-dimensional effort. It will, in the first instance, include air power, which we did in conjunction with the Iraqis and the Kurds uh, to push them back. There will have to be support on the ground. The president has said this. So an important element of this, and this will take time to build, will be for us to rebuild, if you will, the Iraqi security forces, which had degraded terribly under Maliki's leadership, frankly. He, uh, uh, it was a, he ran an authoritarian, sectarian operation, and he paid a big price, uh, and we are paying the price of this. So we're going to have to build, train, advise, and assist, assist with organization, assist with intelligence. Uh, we already have 15 or 1,600 uh, op op operators on the ground in Iraq. That'll have to grow, I think, over time. Uh, and so I think with respect to the Iraqi uh, forum, I think we can actually, uh, I think we know how to do this and I think can, can, can succeed. Syria is more complicated, but again, uh, we have a lot of experience how to do this. And you are, you do have to have, ultimately, you do have to have elements on the ground to support uh, your uh, degrading uh, air, uh, air assets. And we'll have, to, uh, we'll have to develop that over time. But I, I do say this, and I'll finish on this, this is a long-term persistent effort uh, involving a lot of things I think that we know how to do, but it will not happen overnight. So this brings us to Iran rather directly. So a friend of mine who's in the, currently at the Defense Department says, if you ask the question, who is actually fighting and killing ISIL people on the ground today in Iraq and Syria, who's doing the best job of all? And it is Iranian sponsored, Quds directed, Shi'i malicious. Who's guarding the holy sites in Iran? Iranian supported, malicious. Who's been operating very actively in Iraq? Mr. Soleimani. You can see him often. Uh, who's the direct, he's the head of the Quds Force, the second most important person in Iran. So what role does Iran have in the war against ISIL? As far as I know, uh, this is a huge exaggeration of what Iran is doing in a, against ISIS today in Iraq. Uh, it is more the Kurds and less the Iranians. Uh, remember that behind the failure government of Maliki, uh, um, the main force were the Iranians. So, in a way, it's contradicted to what we just heard about the, uh, the about Iraq and how it worked in Iraq before the the new government was um, uh, formed. And if that government will be different and will not be um, part of Iran tool in Iraq, I think it's the benefit of the war against ISIS. Because if that will be again a tool of Iran, um, the, the uh, Sunnis will not cooperate. So if there is a way to do it through the forces on the ground, the tribes in, in Iraq, is by not bringing Iran into um, the center of this operation, because this is a contradiction that cannot survive. Iranian-centered job in this fight means that the tribes, which are essential to any success against ISIS, will not cooperate. Um, so Soleimani, yes, Soleimani is there. Soleimani is also in Gaza, helping to build Hamas. Yes. Soleimani is also around the world in the last three years, 
I tried to make at least 30 terror um, uh, operations against the State of Israel. And, and the so, US. And, 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 and in the US some in cases, DC. the US yes. in DC itself. So Soleimani is, is everywhere. And, and, but I don't think that up till now, at least, he was so crucial um, in containing the ISIS. And I think that the, the, um, the, Air, the United States Air Force was much more um, important in this job of containing the, the, um, the ISIS. And if the United States of America wants to succeed in this war against ISIS, they should recruit the tribes and not Iran. And it, you cannot recruit both of them. They cannot be in the same pot, even if you make all your efforts. It is going back to 100 years of war between the two sides. But let, let me be, be clear. I was not suggesting the US is recruiting Iran. Iran has been doing this itself without any consultation. Yeah. But if you look at, if you go back to Tom, if you, go, if you look at the operation like the one that went down in Amerli just the last couple of weeks, basically the US provided air force and attack targets, but the people who fought on the ground were Iranian militias. Yeah. Well, I think, it's, but I think I agree with General Ahmed, George. I mean, the, the, the key element here will be US will be United States assistance, advice, and forces, uh, I think, in terms of pushing back ISIS. And you go through three or four elements of this, I think the general's exactly right. Uh, you, couldn't have, you, you couldn't have had this conference the other day in Paris if you invited Iran. You wouldn't have had Sunni participation. Uh, and it's absolutely critical. We talked earlier about the necessity of having ground elements supporting this. In, in order to take back territory, you have to have a ground element, right, as General John Major was saying. And the three potential sources of ground elements in Iraq are the Iraqi security forces, number one, uh, that need to be rebuilt. And we are building teams, by the way, uh, in Iraq to work with them. That's what the number of our forces are doing. Uh, number two would be the Peshmerga, that is the Kurd uh, militia, Kurd forces in northern Iraq. And the third will be the Sunni tribes. And one of the most important initiatives that we're pursuing in Iraq right now is the development of so-called national guards, right, who are really the, 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 the successors to the Iraq awakening, the Anbar awakening who will be Sunni-based, locally-based guard units, right, who are going to be another critical source of, um, of being able to stabilize Iraq and push against ISIS. And, and it is contrary to having the Iranians directly involved. Second, these Shia militias, right, you know, the, uh, the last uh, iteration of the Shia militia groups in Iraq were killing us, okay? So, uh, you know, we have been right up against these guys, Graham, all right? And, uh, Enough said uh, on this, right? You know, so, uh, so and is that a fair point, yeah. uh, in General? No, I'm, I'm not. I'm not but, 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 no, but the point I'm is, not it's a these so are good guys. I'm just no, asking but, but who is you, actually killing yeah. who. Well, let me tell and you where I it goes, though. For yeah. the Iraqi army, yeah. uh, just to be the skeptic for yeah. a second, I think that we, for eight years, spent uh, how many billions of dollars and trained yeah. a, a force of 350,000. Yeah. that we said were certified, and I look and see how they fight, yeah. I don't see any fight there. Well, but they have, well this, this had, as I said earlier, one of the things, one of the, principal, one of the principal projects the United States will undertake, right, is to take this back under, from out from under the political cronyism that Maliki had run with respect to the armed forces, and to reprofessionalize it, frankly, uh, and it's a project that we've, un that we've undertaken. The point on the Shia militias is, is this, is that it is contrary to our having to work with uh, a number of the uh, Sunni groups. Um, and um, uh, you, you have to also ask yourself about what are the, what's the Iranian interest in the kind of government that Iraq will have. Uh, and again, we need to have a unity government there that, that reaches out and doesn't commit the same mistakes that the Maliki government did. And the last point I'll make on Iran is this. It, it is very important that anything that they try to indicate to us that they would do in terms of assistance in Iraq not be able to be used in any way as leverage in the nuclear negotiations, uh, which uh, are you know, we have obviously a lot of number of crises going on in the world, uh, including this ISIS pushback, as I said, which I see as a long-term counterterrorism effort that I think we can succeed at. But the most important security negotiation going on in the world right now Absolutely. is the U.S.-Iranian nuclear, the, strike that, the international community, P5 right. plus one uh, Iranian negotiations. And President Rouhani and the Iranian team will be in New York next week for uh, you are for the UN General yeah. Assembly, Starting as tomorrow. will President Obama and will uh, Prime Minister Bibi Netanyahu. And actually the conversations and then negotiations of P5 plus one are just starting up now. Now, 
we're almost a year into the interim agreement, which you, you helped create the, the context for that. The interim agreement between the P5 plus one and Iran essentially froze, uh, again, it's more complicated than that, but in, a, in one line froze the Iranian overt advance on the one hand and sanctions on the other for a year. So at the time, if I did my homework right, uh, 24th of November. Yes, and when the agreement was reached, uh, General Amador, you s wrote a piece in the New York Times in which you said, this agreement, quote, made the world a more dangerous place, close quote. So looking back on the year, uh, you agree or disagree, and then on that basis, if we l ask what's gonna happen in New York, or what's gonna happen by November 24th, should we extend it or not? Or if not, what? Yeah. First of all, I agree with myself. I, Good. I mean, you know, it's pr problematic, but that's what I decided. Uh, I, I thought then, and I think today, that there was one big mistake on the basis of this interim agreement. And this is the, um, the, um, the notion that for having a negotiation with the Iranians, the United States of America should ease the sanctions on Iran. I thought that basically it's not the right way to, to make um, negotiations with Iran. And if you look at the results, the Iranians didn't compromise. And it is almost a year since then. Um, they found many ways to enhance their uh, economy. More than actual uh, enhancement, it is the psychological um, atmosphere around it. And you look at the, the uh, Iranian real, you can see it uh, going up since then. And the, the pressure was, is not the same pressure that had the, on their uh, system a year ago because of the easing of some of the sanctions, not all of them, of course, but some of them. And I thought that uh, so psychologically, it was a, um, you missed an opportunity to put more pressure, or at least to keep the same pressure to negotiate with the Iranians under heavy pressure and not to ease it. I know I'm, I'm in the business of negotiation with the Iranians, I think, uh, 15 years. And I remember the Europeans, when you didn't pay, they take part in this negotiation, telling us all the time that this is a, um, a very important and, and very uh, critical, and, and, and they call it uh, um, dialogue. Uh, at the end, I understood, in this dialogue, both sides sit together and criticize the Americans and the Israelis. Nothing happened during the dialogue with the Europeans and, and, and the Iranians, but one. The Iranians continue to enhance their capability to build nuclear um, weapon at the end. And I thought a year ago that we have a moment here that we should stand fist and don't give up to put pressure on the Iranians and to use the pressure to lead them into compromise. What happened is that in the last minute, um, the, the decision to ease part of the sanctions, led the Iranians to the feeling that they don't want the world to worry. The other side wants the agreement more than Iran, so we should not compromise. And I think today that that was a huge mistake, but what more worrying more is not the, it's not the past, it's the future. The Iranians are now playing a game. They don't give anything, and in the last 24 mini, um, uh, hours, they will put offer on the table and everyone will feel great about it because compared to the very pessimistic situation today or 24 hours before that, here we have an offer from the Iranians. And although it was very clear when the um, um, Secretary of State said that bad agreement is worse than no agreement, some people around the world which do not like the fact that the President of the United States of America said that there is another option on the table and the truth of the matter is that before the 
this administration of President Obama, the United States of America, didn't have the capability to do the job. And because of strict order from the President, United States of America today has the capability. Too many people around the world don't like this capability and not want that this option will be used. And they might put pressure to get the bad agreement and to call it a good one. And from our point of view, from the Israel perspective, this is the worst results of any negotiation. And we made everyone understood that that will not, bad agreement will not tie the hands of the State of Israel and we will have to make our own calculation based on what was said by the President of the United States of America. Israel should be in a position to defend itself by itself. So Tom, is the world a more dangerous place today because of the agreement? So that's the first question, as General Yakovlev argued a year ago, yeah. yes or no. And then as you look to the next stage, are you worried we're going to make a bad agreement or that there's going to be no agreement? And if there's no agreement, what's our, what's our next best move? Yeah. Well, that's a lot of questions. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. so let me start, let me start from the beginning. Uh, one, let's ask how, we, how did we get here? Because General Amidor and I worked very hard on this together. We got here through a comprehensive pressure effort. Uh, and, uh, and a number of... Uh, Led a by the United States of America. Yeah. And a number of people didn't think we would do it or that we could pull it off. Uh, and it was, it, again, it was, a, it was a, a relentless effort with many dimensions. It had obviously the economic sanctions dimension, including uh, really uh, very uh, tightly uh, targeted sanctions on the energy sector in Iran and cut in half their, uh, their uh, energy revenues. Uh, and, it, and because of the, it's an important insight again for it's a, another good paper for somebody at the Kennedy School, because of the unique place that the United States has in the international financial system um, with our banking system here and our, the dollar, uh, the United States has tremendous ability through its sanctions to, uh, to affect countries. So it goes like this. Uh, if a bank in the world, we can put a sanction in place that says, and we did with respect to Iran, if you deal with a certain bank in Iran, or in this case, the Iranian Central Bank, you can't deal with the U.S. system. Uh, and that's a very powerful sanction uh, because you can't be an international bank and not deal with the U.S. system and deal in dollars. That's a very important aspect. Of me, the most, it's the most powerful aspect of our sanctions regime. We put those economic sanctions in place, working with the Congress and working with partners throughout the world, including, by the way, the Chinese and the Russians. Uh, that's a whole other story as to, how that, as to how that came about. It basically came about because we, at the outset of the administration, they came to us and said, you have to negotiate with the Iranians, you have to open the door. We said, well, we'll make a bona fide offer. But if they don't come through the door that we open, you have to work with us to put in place a, a pressure campaign. Because it was our analysis and looking at Iranian behavior since the revolution uh, that the only time the Iranian state had made really substantial changes in strategy was under extreme pressure. Uh, and that was the kind of pressure that we decided to put together. It had ele other elements to it, including diplomatic isolation and pressure. Uh, and as General Amidor said, we also undertook a substantial buildup of forces in the region to indicate to them and to the world that, in fact, the statement that we made, that all options are on the table, we had the ability to do it. Uh, and we do today, by the way, still have the ability to do it. There are between 35 and 40,000 U.S. forces. Uh, in the Persian Gulf and a full range of capabilities to execute anything that we decide to do. So we got here through a, uh, a, a multi-dimensional, relentless, multi-year uh, coalition pressure campaign, I think is a fair way uh, to describe it. This resulted in the spring of 2013 in Rouhani being elected, I think. Rouhani came to the, uh, to, came to the Iranian people uh, who were under extreme economic pressure and said he would do something about the economy. The only way to do something about the economy would be to address the nuclear file. Uh, and that is essentially, I think, how we got to these negotiations. I think an important set of lessons there with respect to statecraft and with respect to Iranian behavior, which is very difficult, that's a whole other topic, Maybe. difficult to penetrate. Uh, but now to the uh, interim agreement, which was entered. Uh, I think it's actually a fairly solid basis on which to have a negotiation, but that doesn't go to the point of the ultimate outcome. Uh, with respect to it being a solid basis for negotiation, it did freeze in place a growing program, would have been a growing program. Um, it, it indicated that, and they agreed and they have abided by it, that they couldn't increase the amount of low-enriched uranium they have in their stockpiles, that they couldn't put any new centrifuges uh, in, in place and operate them, that they would stop the uh, construction at their plutonium, potentially plutonium-producing 
plant uh, at, uh, at, uh, uh, at Iraq uh, and, uh, uh, in Iran. Uh, and with respect to the most dangerous stockpile that they had, this 20% enriched uranium, which Prime Minister Netanyahu pointed out in a, in a speech at the United Nations was a red line for him. Uh, as part of these negotiations, as part of the interim deal, they agreed to dilute or, or um, basically neutralize uh, their entire, uh, their entire uh, stockpile of 20% uranium, and they agreed to intensive in inspections. Uh, so you had a freeze and a bit of a rollback and intense inspections, which I think was obviously a, uh, it went to really what people worried about in the negotiation, which is that during the pendency of the negotiation, the Iranians would grow the program. Uh, we would talk, they would build. Uh, and that's not what happened here. So I think it is a reasonable basis on which to have a, uh, to have a negotiation. Uh, going forward, there have been very tough issues uh, in, a very short, in a short time to actually deal with them, frankly, uh, and fundamental issues with respect to uh, the, uh, the level of confidence that the world can have that the Iranians can be kept from, kept from pursuing a nuclear weapon without us being able to affect it, which is essentially the, which is essentially the, the goal. So do you worry about the Iranians coming in, uh, the Amador hypothesis? Here we are, we get to November 22nd, 23rd, it's 40. So we're going to come to the end of the period. They come and put some proposition yeah. on the table, and yeah. the Obama administration accepts a bad deal because they're so eager to have any deal? Well, the Obama administration in the world should not accept a bad deal, right? Uh, because I do think that at the end of the day, I think the leverage is on the side of the, uh, over the long haul, the leverage is on the side of the uh, international community. Uh, so we shouldn't accept a bad deal, and I don't think we'll accept, we'll accept a bad deal. But this point that General Amadora has made about uh, coming in with last minute things, uh, I think is a, is a fair point. Indeed, you see what's happening here is that uh, you'll see that the leadership in Iran has been um, putting maximalist positions on the table. Indeed, so the Supreme Leader indicate that, the, that uh, they now have about 19,000 centrifuges uh, okay. Uh, in place, and about half of that, about 94 or 9,500, I think, Gary operating uh, in, uh, in Iran right now. And the Supreme Leader went out and said they needed 190,000, right, you know, and of course, that's, that's, it doesn't take a negotiations genius here at the Harvard Negotiation Center to say that that's a maximalist position and they're going to come in with a, with a position far short of 190,000 and call it a compromise. Obviously, that's an obvious set of moves that could be made. And I think that in these negotiations and the talks that are going to begin this week, I would think that the, that, that the U.S. side should indicate that that's not on, uh, that essentially there are some absolutely uh, critical requirements here that are going to have to be met or there won't be a deal. Okay. So, and there will be consequences. <coughs> the last thing I'll say is, if I can, I'm sorry, yeah. is that it is critically important uh, that we uh, in, uh, in the international community communicate to the Iranians that there's a high cost to not having a deal. Uh, and that, uh, that's, a, that's a critical point uh, that in fact, because they, they have a way of, of of, um, of, of deluding themselves sometimes about their situation in the world. I think it's very important for the United States, the international community, to indicate that if we don't come to an agreement with the Iranians that gives the international community the required confidence that they're not pursuing a nuclear weapon, that the price will be very high uh, and, and increasingly high over time. And Excuse again, me. just uh, I, we're going to turn to the audience right now. There are microphones on the ground floor and on the loges. And actually, David, if you have a question, We'll let you ask the first question. But in any case, just to follow up on your point, Tom. So uh, I would say the betting in the conventional wisdom uh, in the community that surrounds things is that we'll get to November 24th. We will not have an agreement. We'll find a way to extend, basically, the freeze for modest relief. So there won't be an increased price. So you're saying if we don't... So what? <coughs> What, what would you do to try to make credible that we're not simply going to let this roll for another six months or a year, that, that there's, a, there's a price to... Well, I think, no, I th my point was in the event of a breakdown. A breakdown. Right, yeah, a breakdown in the negotiations between the United States and on the one side and the West and the, such a, and the international community, again, including the Chinese and the Russians on one side and the Iranians, that, that, are, that a breakdown would come at a high, at a high cost. Now, I think with that... If, if that will not, if not will be an agreement between, the, the, be, between now and the 24th of November, if the pressure will not be raised on the Iranians, the chances to have an agreement uh, is, is, is decreasing. Yeah. Because you can see during the year, 
they manage their economy through the ease of the economies. They are they're not satisfied from the result. They want a better situation, but they, they can live with it. And if the other side can live with the pressure, it means that the pressure is not enough and you will not get to the point that you want to, uh, to get. So, of course, technically, the easiest solution is to extend it. This is no, no, nothing happened. But it's not true that nothing happened. It means that the Iranians have another six months to deal with their economy and to find better ways to deal with the problems that they are facing because of the sanctions that still exist. So if you want an agreement, if you want a good agreement at the end, you have to raise the level of pressure. And I think that that will be psychologically and, and politically mistake not to do it and just to extend. Okay, well, we'll get a chance to watch that. Let me see if David or Gary wants to make a comment. Uh, Gary Seymour, who's the director for research at the Belfer Center, was managing the Iran He was representative of Iran in the White House. Ah, of Iran or of Israel? Of Iran. <laughs> of Iran, okay. I don't think many of his, uh, no. I don't think Tom recognized him in that role. <laughs> no. So he played it very Whenever we spoke about Iran, Tom would say, let's Gary come in. Let Gary talk. Okay. Well, that's because he knew about Iran and was dealing with Iran. Gary, you want to say anything? Go, go, go defend yourself for a second. Get the microphone, over, please. Yeah. And then we'll go to this gentleman. <laughs> the, American, the, American, the, the American people are lucky to have Gary in the White House, believe Absolutely. me. Absolutely. And we're very lucky to have him here at the Belfast. That Center. I know. I don't yeah. know how he's a, as a teacher. That I don't know. <laughs> hey, brilliant. Well, thank, thank you very much, General. I must say it was a real, you know, when I got the phone call to come to Tom's office and it was just me and the two of you and one other person taking notes, it was quite interesting to listen to the debate. And, uh, you know, sometimes I thought one side or the other had the better side of the argument, but of course <laughs> I, I had my instructions, uh, uh, so, so I knew what side I had to argue in favor of. But I do think it was really a tremendous relationship that we built on the Iran issue, and it really, I think, even though we did sometimes disagree, I think it really did, you know, was it, certainly in my government experience, one of the best examples I know of an incredibly close, you know, cooperation between two governments. Um, I, you know, I guess the question I would ask is the, as far as I can tell, the supreme leader, as he views the world and calculates the balance of power, he thinks that things are going in his favor. He thinks that the Ukraine crisis has weakened the unity of the P5 plus one and therefore you know, reduced pressure on him to make painful nuclear concessions. He thinks the rise of the threat from Islamic State has made Iran more indispensable and therefore reduces pressure on him. So I think the big challenge that the US and Israel and other countries face is how to persuade him that in fact he can afford to um, continue to say no until he reveals whatever his last minute offer is. And I think, assuming that it's, un, that it's not acceptable, I think there'll be a lot of pressure uh, on Washington to try to keep the process going. Because in the midst of all the other crises we're facing, it's gonna be a hard sell to uh, you know, persuade people that we should add, add yet another complication to the challenges we have in the Middle East. So I'd be interested in, in both of your responses to that. Uh, I think that what, what just, uh, you know, as always what uh, Gary said about the Iran is, 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 this is the picture. This is the real truth of the, of the situation. I can tell you that from the Israeli point of view, the threat of Iran is totally different league of threats than all the others. So we, if, if we have to make a competition between allocating resources to any of these uh, crises, from the Israeli point of view, the priority is very clear. And I, I, I think that there is a way not to add another front to the Middle East uh, crisis, but to use the, the end of the negotiations in, 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 in November and to begin to build a new pressure on Iran. So the Iranians will have to understand that although uh, Russia, Ukraine, Europe issue, um, in a way, some tension around China, uh, and other issues that might bring the leader to think that is indispensable, uh, 
um, the, the, the world can continue to put pressure because the, 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 it is not making any more um, problems within the Middle East relating to other crises. So at least that will be uh, clear. At the end, you know, if that will not help, we will all have to sit together to come to understanding what is the next the next uh, uh, page, we did it in the, f in the, in the past in, in, I think, relatively um, good success and should be done in the future in the same uh, way of, of cooperation, although we know, everyone understands that things that you will see, that you see from uh, Washington are, look different when you look at them from Jerusalem. It's the nature of the world. It's, uh, you are a superpower and we are little country, you are far away, and we are in the mix of the Middle East. Uh, and other, many other issues which are making the situation even more complicated. But I think that the cooperation is, 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 is essential to have a, a better future regarding the issue of, of Iran. And the, the more close the cooperation is, the, the easier to deal with the with the issues in the in the future, but from the Israel point of view, it should be very clear: the priority is totally um, in the Iranian side. Cool. Well, I, I agree on a couple of things. First of all, I think it is it is a there's a tremendous amount of sheer work that would have to be done to get an agreement done by November 24th. Uh, these are very complicated issues. And the other, we're trying to head off multiple paths that Iran might have to a nuclear weapon, whether it be through HEU. Uh, enhancement, whether it be through plutonium production uh, or whether it be through a covert operation. And remember, we've, uh, you know, the two, the two plants that we know about uh, at Natanz and at uh, uh, near the religious city of Gom at Fordo uh, were covert plants uh, that we discovered and uh, blew the whistle on. Uh, so uh, that's, another, that's a whole other uh, dimension to these negotiations. So there's a very complicated, a tremendous workload uh, in order to try to achieve it. Uh, secondly, uh, there, I, I do think that, our, that, that the Congress in the United States uh, would act uh, in the event of a breakdown of, of negotiations between the P5 plus one and Iran with a very severe set of next stage sanctions. Uh, third, with respect to Russia and China, um, the, uh, uh, Russia to date has actually been a very important uh, partner uh, in, the, uh, in the effort to pressure, to pressure Iran. We'll see how that We'll see how that continues, but to date they have been because I don't think that they want to see Iran have a nuclear weapon. But again, there are more dimensions to this uh, uh, now. China has energy needs, uh, but again, under the sanctions that we have in place, the money that China pays in large part for any, any additional imports that they have from Iran goes into an escrow account uh, and doesn't go to the Iranian, Iranian uh, bottom line. So a complicated set of, set of decisions uh, here. I do think it's important for, there to, for us to be clear that there will be dramatically increased cost to a break uh, to a breakdown. On Israeli-U.S. cooperation, I think, it's a, I think it's a, it is absolutely essential. And I said something at the top I'll spend 30 seconds expanding on, uh, which is that uh, General Amidor and I were very keen to have our cooperation not just be at a kind of a political position level, level if you will, but rather to be really close cooperation through our professional services. Uh, and I said to really drill down uh, and come to ground truth on the facts. Uh, and uh, to uh, really ex uh, explore differences in perception. As General Amador said, the, why, it, why does it seem different from Washington than it does from Jerusalem? And to really try to understand that in a very clear way. And, it was, and it, we had a lot of success with that, I think, and it resulted in our joint efforts. I learned an American expression, to be on the same page. Yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah. Good. And if, right. if, if you and Tom were on the same page, I would say, take it to the bank. Yeah. It'll be good. This gentleman, please introduce yourself, uh, ask your question, and we're open. Uh, thank you, gentlemen. My name is William Den. I'm a second year uh, student here at the Kennedy School. Um, I I'm curious, in the broader context of, of your roles as national security advisors, how do you both particularly think about uh, the role of strategic communication uh, within overall national security strategy. I think that uh, this past week with President Obama uh, speaking, uh, some would argue he did a, a good job, others not so much, but I think also within the Israeli context this past summer uh, was a good case where Israel was winning uh, the battles on the battlefield, but in terms of public relations and the strategic uh, communications concept, probably did a very poor job in that regard. So how, so how do you think about uh, the importance, the role of it, 
what you tell the public, what you don't tell the public, um, and where does that fall within an overall uh, national strategy formulation? Thank you. So Tom, why don't you start off? Because uh, I mean, having come from a political world yeah. as well as a yeah. as well as a policy world, yeah. you thought a lot about that. Yeah. yeah, I have. I mean, it's essential. I mean, the, the first order problem is to get is to get the uh, uh, is to get the policy right. Um, now, policy people out here in, in the audience, this is, this is an important lesson. Uh, policy people think that that's the that's well, that's about where we're done. We spent 50 hours together. We got the policy right. It's absolutely the right answer, and this is what we should do. And that's about 25% of it, right? And then the other pieces of it are implementation and execution. Uh, and no policy, uh, Graham, if I were, if I were uh, conducting a course here and looking No, for, not if, when. when yeah, conducting when. a course here, uh, I don't <laughs> think you should, you should ever allow a policy paper to be called complete unless it has an implementation plan. Right. Uh, it has execution and accountability aspects to it. Uh, because there, there are a lot of great policy ideas and decisions that um, are left in the, in the Situation Room or in the Prime Minister's uh, uh, office uh, in Israel that, 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 uh, that were not executed. So execution and communication is important too. It's an important aspect of every, of every policy effort that you, that, you, that, you, that you undertake. The challenges, of course, are many. Uh, one is, and again, outcomes ultimately is what's, what's important, but, but um, in terms of being able, to, the challenges, as I said, are many. One is that you have multiple audiences that you're talking to simultaneously. You have domestic political audiences that you're talking to, but you're also communicating around the world to your adversaries and your friends. And how, these ex how this is done, uh, the power of the language, the clarity um, uh, of the plan going forward has, will have a lot to do with your ability to put together coalitions, for example, right, and to build confidence in the efforts that you're uh, that you are uh, undertaking. So every policy has to have a communications aspect to it. Uh, it's important before, for example, before you would leave the Situation Room in any meeting that I was, was chairing, that you, and it's not just public relations, it really is an intimate, an intimate part of the policy, to, to really decide how are we gonna talk about this, right? What are the key elements to it? How are we gonna communicate it? What are we calling it? Uh, what are the time frames that we're doing this project in? Uh, how are we going to communicate those time frames? What are our expectations? These are all absolutely critical parts of, uh, of policy making, and you shouldn't leave the room until you have some uh, consensus on that and, and then the ability to execute on it. So, oh. I, I think that we, we, are, we are both democracies, and I think that we have, I don't like the word PR. It's not PR. No. It's to buy the legitimacy because you cannot act in a democratic state without the legitimacy of the people. And we have two different systems how to do it. But at the end of the day, it's going to the same fundamental question. Do, does the, 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 the average American and the average Israeli behind the decision of the, of the prime minister or the, pre, or the president? Can we bring the people to understand what we do and why we do. And this is a very complicated job. I think that in Israel it's more complicated because we have a coalition system in which the, 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 the prime minister is not commander in chief, mm -hmm. not at all. You heard members of cabinet speaking against the decision of the cabinet through the, well, you know, the other way, the, the, um, one of the ambassadors, of one of the big democracies in the world told me you are a crazy democracy. And in a way, it's true. Um, but I prefer to live in a crazy democracy than in non-democracy. Mm -hmm. I think that the second stage is how you gain the legitimacy around the world. And here, from the Israeli point of view, there are priorities. <coughs> and no question that we understand that the most important is to gain the legitimacy in some important capitals around the world. And Washington is number one. And then in other places, in other countries. And, and, and at the end of the day, we know that when it is coming to international arena, Israel is um, in a very problematic situation because numbers speak. In the United Nations, we are the only Jewish state. There are 22 Arab countries, 57 Muslim countries, and the Non-Alliance Caucus, which is 123 countries, in which the Arab countries are third of the, of, the, of the fingers. So in the international community as a whole, we don't have a chance. It's an uphill battle. But we have to go through all the, the levels. 
First of all, to have the legitimacy. Domestically, without it in democracy, you cannot do anything uh, serious. Then to um, important capital, capitals around the world, Washington number one, and then to see what can be done uh, in, in, in the um, international uh, community arena. From our point of view, it's very, very complicated. The last stage is almost impossible. Yeah. Graham, well, on, the on, on the strategic communications point too, we face a special uh, challenge, of course, in the United States, and I think around the world, with respect to communications, with respect to extremism. Uh, and that's a strategic communications challenge, I think, which is very important and could be a, lo a long discussion. Some things, of course, uh, need to be kept secret. Uh, you know, and we have, a, you know, we have a, a famous example in the United States in recent, in recent years of the bin Laden operation, which was, uh, we first went to the president on the bin Laden operation in August of 2010, and we executed the bin Laden operation the first week in May of 2011, uh, and it was held secret because it had to be. Uh, we had, uh, if it had leaked, uh, we would have lost bin Laden, we would have been spent another 10 years chasing him, and if it had leaked, we would have put our special forces in extreme danger. Uh, so there are instances where, in fact, uh, operations, as, as, as you know, have to be kept secret. I did learn a lesson in that operation, by the way, uh, which is this. People say, it's impossible to keep a secret that long in Washington. How did you do it? Uh, and the secret is this. If you want to keep a secret, don't tell anybody. This is the key insight. <laughs> I think for, for students at the school, there's a big lesson there, and it would make a good case study for... Uh, an additional topic. Mm -hmm. This gentleman, please. Hi, my name's Aaron. I'm a freshman at the college. President Obama's relationship with the Prime Minister Netanyahu has been described as a troubled one. So how would you describe their relationship and how do personal politics affect larger cooperation between the US and Israel? Good question. Uh, I, you know what, Tom, I'll begin. This will be easier. Uh, first of all, I think that people exaggerate about the role of what people call um, personal relations between, um, between um, um, heads of states and, and leaders. At the end of the day, the relations between the rest of America based on so many ingredients that the personal relation is only one of them. And in many cases, there was kind of exaggeration about how bad the relations are. So I think that all together, um, it is very important to, a, to be uh, frank, fair, and not surprise the other side. And you keep, if you keep those rules, the personal relations are important, but not the most important factor in the relations with the United States of America. And, and, and Israel, and when I met Tom first time, I told him, I'll do my best not to surprise you even once. And if you keep this way of having in the White House people that you can speak before things happen, and even to inform them about our initiatives and what we intend to do, uh, it's the best way to um, make the relations even better although in some occasions the leaders don't agree. And as I said at the beginning, uh, it's, it's natural. I mean, I would be surprised if the President of the United States of America would agree about everything with the uh, Prime Minister of the State of Israel. But if the basic element of these relations, the understanding that at the end of the day, we have the, the um, Americans um, understand the security needs of the State of Israel. And when it is clear that if worst come to worst, the Americans will be there to help Israel. In either it is in the international community or relating to weapon systems which are needed. I think if these basis, basic elements are there, with all due respect to personal relations, they are very important, but not the most important. Tom? Well, there were, <coughs> they were you know, clearly um, disagreements at, at points between President Obama and Prime Minister Netanyahu uh, over, 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 over certain issues. Um, as I said, as General Amador said, as you would, as you would expect, but, the, but there was never, and we were very clear on this, um, 
there was never, we never lost sight of the fundamentals of the relationship, I think, as, as I grew to La Major, <clears throat> which was that the United States and Israel are allies, the United States had an unshakable commitment to Israel's security, and that when we met on security issues, we actually said it consciously, we leave the politics at the door, uh, we, have an, we have another job to do, uh, and, that, and to focus on, the, focus on the fundamentals, and I think that's the, been the key. Although, that this, this point that General Amador made about no surprises is a really important point. Nothing could uh, undermine uh, an alliance relationship or a close uh, a country relationship more than being, being unfairly surprised. Uh, and that's a, that's a very important part of the personal, uh, the personal relationship um, uh, between, uh, between leaders and between their staffs. We're going to the lady in the Meloge, please. My name's Hannah, I'm visiting from London. How much do you think that a strategy for dealing with Islamic State, which both the US and the UK have struggled with, might never have been necessary had the American and British governments armed and supported the more moderate Islamist opposition in Syria when they asked for it several years ago? Ooh. Well, I, 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 you know, the, uh, uh, we, have, we have had a... Um, an immense uh, challenge and effort against uh, uh, radical groups that certainly predated the Syrian, the Syrian, uh, the Syrian war and predated any consideration of arming, of arming moderate, uh, moderate forces in Syria. This is a much bigger issue uh, uh, than that. Uh, it's, a, it's, an, it's an issue that has multiple dimensions and that we've been dealing with um, for decades now uh, and we'll have to deal with for a long time, a long time, a long time to come. Uh, the roots of ISIS, which is, but the particular thing that we're dealing with right now, are complicated. Uh, they do have uh, their, 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 their roots actually in the, uh, in the American invasion of, of Iraq in 2003. Uh, ISIS is a derivative or a subsequent organization to Al-Qaeda in Iraq. Um, and then was able to um, reinvigorate itself because the war in Syria became extended. Uh, and was able to come back into Iraq because Maliki failed in governance. So there are a number of aspects to this. Uh, it's not a unidimensional, not a unidimensional problem with respect to ISIS. Uh, and ISIS, as I said, is, is the next phase in a multidimensional global effort that we have and challenge with respect to, uh, to, to, uh, to radical groups that threaten the United States and the West. But Jacob, uh, if I can you had a perspective on, on Syria. Okay. Yes, if yeah. I can say something in principle. Please. I think it's very important to students to understand. The Middle East now is kind of a perfect storm. You cannot ask questions about one element of the reality and to think that, that if that will, it's a failure of someone, if that failure hadn't been occurred, the perfect storm would not happen. It, the, the life and, and the world and the reality does not play like that. I mean, there are so many elements that brought the Middle East to the present situation in which ISIS can succeed in Iraq that you can go back to history and say that would not happen and that would not happen and that would not happen. I don't know what, what, what was the situation at all. So I, I think it's a, a huge way of, of trying to understand issues. The question if should the United States of America and Israel in, for, in this case would have, will be more helpful to the rebels in Syria, it's stand by itself and we have to ask the question and answer the answer and try to understand if you made a mistake or not. To connect it to the reality on the ground now in, 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 in Iraq, I think it's a huge mistake. It's a, it's a, I think if there is a perfect storm, this is the example and you cannot separate it to different hundred ingredients and to say what happened if one of these ingredients would not exist in the, in, in the reality. It's it's a, it's important question, interesting one, but there is no answer to your question. If that happened, what would have been? The gentleman in the loge, are you there at the microphone or no? Then here, this gentleman, please. Back to the floor. The orange yes. one. The orange. orange. You. Yes. Yes. Okay. The orange. Okay. You're up. Is this somebody no, else? you. Yourself. Okay. Yes, yeah, sure, okay. please. <laughs> Thank you Introduce so much. Yeah. My name is Malik Siraj Akbar. I am a mid-career student here at the Kennedy School and also a reporter for our campus newspaper, The Citizen. Uh, it's very ironic. I mean, sometimes back I saw a photograph from a uh, women's conference from Saudi Arabia, and all the participants were men. And this time I see a panel on Iran. I don't see somebody from the other side of the conversation. Out of curiosity as a journalist, I wish there were 
uh, an Iranian panelist who would give an Iranian perspective. But my question is, how if, much... If the Iranian National Security Advisor had been available, <laughs> we would have had him. <laughs> Keep going. Uh, and I'm ready to be part of the panel. That will be wonderful. I'll cover it again as a reporter. <laughs> My question is, how much can we afford to isolate Iran? Because ISIS is the culmination of mismanagement of Syria and Iraq. And now that the US is also planning to withdraw from Afghanistan, where you have many ISIS, you know, organizations like uh, the Taliban, organizations like Jaysh e Adal or Jandullah inside Iran, it's again ironic that the US will eventually, or the international community, will need a country like Iran to fight all these Sunni extremist groups. So if you isolate Iran, what is going to happen to the future of Afghanistan? Well, uh, what, what's going to be happening in Afghanistan? Because that's the blunder we committed in, uh, in Iraq or in Syria, keeping Iran outside. And if, the, if Iranians are kept out for coming up for a solution for post-2014 you know, Afghanistan, don't you think there's, there's going to be a rise of the Taliban again? And the Iranians will eventually be your friends, not the Pakistanis. Although I'm from Pakistan, I think Pakistanis have had long-standing relationships with the, with the Taliban. They are supporting the Jandullah or Jaysh al-Adal. And all these groups are very closely connected with Al-Qaeda, with ISIS. So don't you think like, you know, you're encouraging a big conflagration across the Muslim world? Thank you. Another big question, <laughs> sir. Well, I, well, I, I mean, here, we should do a little history here, right? Um, uh, the Obama administration came in and expressly undertook an effort uh, to allow Iran to walk through the doors of modernity. Uh, essentially, uh, in, in the year 2009, as I referenced obliquely or earlier, the United States undertook an outreach effort to Iran uh, directly uh, to the most senior ranks in the Iranian government. Uh, and offer to deal directly, and we took, uh, and the Obama administration took some criticism for this, both, both during the campaign and when he became president, to deal directly with the Iranian leadership, trying to settle what, it, what was at that point one of the most, not the only, but one of the most important disputes between Iran and the international community, that of its nuclear program, uh, which it had pursued uh, covertly and had violated any number of Security Council resolutions and was a direct threat uh, in our judgment, to the region and to the United States and to the global proliferation regimes. Uh, and we undertook a direct effort uh, to talk to the Iranians and, again, to allow them to walk through a door to engage in conversation. The Iranians rejected that effort. And what happened is, is in June of 2009, you had the elections in Iran, um, uh, where the Iranian state uh, pushed back against uh, dissidents and it went very hard line. Uh, and we have not been able to engage in that, in that kind of, in that kind of um, 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 conversation with the Iranians, and we, and we did what we said we were going to do, which is that we would, undertake, we would undertake a pressure campaign, which we did, in order to bring them to the table to discuss the nu nuclear program, and that, again, that's what's, uh, that's what's happened. The choice is with the Iranians. Uh, the Iranian government has a choice here. The Iranian government can make it, if, if the Iranian government uh, is, as they say, not committed and doesn't intend to, and indeed isn't following a fatwa from the Supreme Leader indicating that it's a sin to have nuclear weapons, there's a way to get to the table and make a deal here, right? Uh, which would uh, take a big step towards Iran coming back into the international community in a way that it hasn't since 1979. So the opportunity is there for the Iranians to make, to make the deal. In the interim, right, the United States has to protect itself, and the United States has to pursue its interest, and it's a deep interest in the proliferation regime around the world, and in protecting our, our friends and allies in the, uh, uh, in the region. And that's only one element of Iranian, of Iranian behavior. So, the choice really rests with, 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 with Iran. Uh, the Iranian people have gotten precisely nothing out of this effort uh, to, uh, to develop uh, nuclear weapons. Uh, it has cost the Iranian state immense amounts of money. It is now, the sanctions have cost them even more money. Uh, and they've essentially locked themselves out of, the, out of, out of a lot of the modern world. Uh, and Iran is a, 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 a country that should be in the modern world. But their leadership has chosen to go a different way. Penetrating the Iranian leadership is a very, very difficult task. It's very, isol very isolated. I don't know that the supreme leader has been out of Iran since he became supreme leader in 1989. I don't think that he has. Uh, deep animosity and mistrust of the West, uh, and uh, thus uh, a, a, a very difficult time on, with respect to engagement. So the Iranian, the Iranian government, their leadership, uh, has a choice. And it hasn't been the United States denying them that choice, we present them with that choice, but, in the, but if they don't take that choice, we have to protect ourselves and pursue, pursue our interests. 
Uh, and it's not just the United States with respect to the nuclear arrangements, it's the, it's the entire international community. There's only one member of the MPT on the face of the earth that hasn't been able to convince the world that it's not pursuing a nuclear weapon, and that's Iran. So do you want to come in on I, I want to, to say something that I learned when I was young. Please. You do not commit suicide in the purpose of saving your life. <laughs> I mean, to make Iran nuclear for not having ISIS or Al-Qaeda or whatever, with all due respect, is to commit suicide for saving what you think might save your life. It's a huge mistake. You have problems, deal with the problems, don't bring even bigger problems into the table. And nuclear Iran is something that the world Many people do not understand. It's the end of the sovereignty of the Gulf countries. The, the price of oil around the world will be determined in Tehran based on their interest. And the, the, the Middle East will be an, um, like a hell because uh, NGOs like um, Hezbollah, um, Hamas, Islamic Jihad and others will feel that they have the umbrella of the Iranian nuclear uh, state and they will act all around the world against interests that they think they should act. And as I told you, Iran is responsible for more than 30 attempts of um, tourism around the world from New Delhi to Bulgaria. And so, that will be only one example of what is what to expect if Iran will have this umbrella. So unfortunately we have time for just the two questions that are up. Put your questions succinctly. We'll take both of them, and then we'll ask for short answers as well. So please introduce yourself. So my name is Claude Tabar. Uh, I'm first year a student in HKS, and I'm from Lebanon. So all this discussion comes like from home. So my question is, um, basically, it, the, the longer you take time to fight ISIS coming from the region, for me, it's very trivial that these people are growing, and they're growing even more organically. So like today, ISIS established systems within every village they, they get in or they conquer, and then the people start to belong to this, uh, to, to ISIS, to the system, and then they teach Islam for the children. So it's, it's a growing, it's a growing uh, society within. And then the longer time you take, therefore the harder it's gonna be to fight them. So what's your strategy along that? Because you cannot go and train like the Iraqi soldiers and then after five years go and fight them. By then they might have two, three countries within that area, so. So what about the timeline? And this, please. Yeah, Jay Livingston. Uh, why don't we put the same amount of effort into uh, eliminating uh, Israel's weapons of mass destruction that we do into Iran and Iraq's weapons of mass destruction? How much longer can we afford to put up with Israel's nuclear blackmail? OK. We have two questions, slightly different questions. <laughs> but, uh, and you can. I'll take the first. You can, you no. can either answer yeah. one, or both, not. or yeah. have you done? Yeah. Well, with, well, um, with respect, I, I, with respect to the uh, to the timeline, I think that's that's the reason. As I said, it's a multi-dimensional effort, different phases. But the initial phase is now. Uh, the initial phase is uh, a uh, intensified going on the offense, as the president indicated the other night, uh, air campaign. Uh, against uh, against ISIS uh, in uh, in Iraq, uh, and not ruling out at any point, as he said, you know, going after ISIS wherever it is, including in Syria. Uh, so I think that I think that's right, and indeed, uh, indeed, the initial effort that was undertaken by the United States was an urgent effort, an urgent effort to present a march on to prevent a march on Baghdad, uh, to present t taking the uh, the Mosul, uh, you know, the, the dam and the other waterworks, uh, and. Uh, 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 to prevent a slaughter of minorities uh, in uh, uh, minority groups in Iraq. So I agree with you that there, there are, there are, there's an urgent aspect to this. Uh, the United States has undertaken that. You saw today, even and yesterday, that the United States undertook more intensive uh, airstrikes and air campaigns around Baghdad. I think you'll see more of that. Uh, but the long-term degradation and defeat will, re it will require, it will require uh, elements on the ground to be built up to retake territory. Uh, and to provide, as General Amador said in the opening, the kinds of intelligence and other aspects that you need to conduct a successful, uh, a successful counter, counterterrorism effort. Um, so, yes, there, there, there's urgent pieces to this, but there's going to be a long-term effort to, uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to take them down, which includes a, a, a lot of political work in Iraq. And Yaakov, we'll leave you the last word. Yeah. Yeah. I'm. I. I want to. I. I agree that 
time is essential. They, I mean, I don't want to give advice. I to do it. You have your generals, and they will make the the, the best uh, plan to to implement the the decision of the uh, commander in chief. Um, I'm not worried about it. The United States of America military system is is full of very talented uh, uh, people that will find the way to do it in in the American way. Um, I want to refer to the logic of the second question. <laughs> I don't know if Israel has nuclear capability or not. But to put a dictatorship that preached to the destruction of other countries and elimination of the Jewish state in the same basket with the Jewish state which defends itself, and to compare between the two and to say, if you refer to that, why don't you refer to the other, is morally, morally uh, a huge uh, defect. And I, I don't want to speak about the whole issue, but the, the logic which is the basis of the question that you know you can ask the question because the police has ammunition and the, and the gang uh, have ammunition, so you can ask about the ammunition of both is morally, I mean, huge failure. I don't understand how such logic is, can live with the um, academic freedom of, of, um, of this place, but I can appreciate the democracy in the uh, in United States of America. Good. 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 So, so actually that last question and a number of others are places to start a debate, not to conclude it. Right. But for tonight, we've concluded this part of the conversation. So uh, let me remind you, there are many other interesting forum events coming up, including tomorrow night at 6 o'clock here in the forum. There's an act, a discussion of reflections on Ferguson and some of America's problems here at home. Mm -hmm. and then. If you look at the calendar, you'll see lots of other events. But for tonight, let's say again thank you to General Amador and Tom Donlin for a wonderful presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. You guys are great. Thank you very much. Yeah.